everybody, welcome to Season 2, Episode 19 of the Hard Truth Inside the Football Industry Podcast with me, Philip Eidson, and Dara McAnthony, Chairman and Co-Owner of English Championship side, Peterborough United. And you know, Dara, I thought, here we are coming into Christmas, we're not going to have a ton of things to talk about, it's a little bit of a quiet period, um, and, and here we are. Um, so, uh, we've got a lot to cover today, but let's start where we usually do, and talk a little bit about... Um, Posh's last performance and sure. looks like from the outside it was you know you lost to Blackpool 3-1 and perhaps another one of those that the result didn't necessarily do you granted to the performance when you, when you yeah I mean I don't know if you've ever listened to the same record 10 times do you know what I mean but um it, it, it kind of it gets in your nerves eventually and um you know describe the game started brilliantly scored took our foot off the gas stopped doing all the good things we were doing controlling the game you're playing a team who hasn't won in seven games, haven't scored for four hours. It's a confidence thing. drives you mad. Um, we were the better team for large parts, but we weren't. Um, I, I suppose we could be toothless would be the right description because, you know, Blackpool weren't toothless. When they got a chance, they took it, you know, whereas we were toothless. Again, got in some great areas, didn't pull the trigger. Our crossing from both fullbacks wasn't good enough. Um, you know, and little things change games. You know, it's 1-1. Really, really good game. Blackpool are a good team. You know that. Second half, there's like 10 minutes to go. And both teams want to win. And fair play to both managers. You know, our manager makes an attacking substitution. And then it's a simple thing that our target man, his job is to hold the ball up. He's on the halfway line. Fails to hold the ball up. They win. They throw a ball in. It's a shit ball. It gets deflected behind our back four who are coming out. And it lands to a Blackpool player. Yeah. Nine times out of ten, the reader offside or the deflection goes out into touch and they score. And then, you know, our bollocks go as usual the minute we concede late like that instead of digging in and thinking, well, there's five minutes left plus injury time. Nope. Um, again, mistake bringing the ball out. They break. Our goalie should make the save. And again, two stupid errors from our mm -hmm. players. And I know I sound harsh, but no, you need to call it for what it is because this is big boy football here. And, and our players have to realize that. You know, one, if you don't hold the ball up and that's your fundamental job, we're going to have a problem. Um, as a defender, if you make a mistake on the edge of your box, it's going to cost you. As a goalkeeper, you can't make mistakes. So, again, you know, there is a result. We should have won a game. We've ended up with another 3-1 loss. It'll be in the history books. There's another away performance. It's terrible. And it's the same script. Mm -hmm. And if that doesn't change, you know, no matter how good we are at home, we're not going to do well in this league. We're not going to be in this league. So, yeah. you know, that has to change. And, and I feel for my manager. Um, you know, the preparation that goes into games, you know, it, the frustration after a game, you know, the money we spend on away travel, you know, three, four grand, you may as well save it and just send the coach up on the day. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those players really, really need to get together now. And that's difficult with COVID going on. But, you know, they need to like get together in a room and beat the shit out of each other, do whatever. But fucking, you know, get your fucking act together. I don't care how bad you are away from home. You don't lose 10 and 11 games. That's not that's not bad. That's disgraceful. So that needs to change because if we're going to climb this league, we have to win away games. Um, so, but I can't fault the the style of play, the way we wanted to play. What I can fault us for being as toothless in the, in the in the areas that matter. You know, you get into the final third. Two things have to happen. One, your players in attacking position have to cross the ball in the box. I'll give you a statistic: Blackpool had twenty six crosses, eight of them were successful. Three goals came from balls that were put into the box you know we had 16 cross attempts two were successful you know you're, you're not going to score goals um so you know who are the fullbacks you got nathan thompson on one side you got joe Tom uh, joe thomason on the other you know your job is to when you get in the final third the way we like to play particularly in the diamonds your fullbacks have to do the the good stuff in that half so look, yeah you got yeah, exactly not good enough not good enough and and our attacking players have to be in the box because all too often as well with us you, you, you know, there was a moment there where young Pock who came off the bench, he went a great run. It wasn't a quick, it wasn't something that happened instantly. He beat a couple of men, went down the left, and you're thinking, right, just as he puts the ball in, there must be five, six of our players in the box because every time Blackpool scored a goal, there must have been seven orange shirts mm -hmm. in the box. And you look in the box, there's only, I think there's only two of our players in there. You know, one of them being a striker who doesn't actually move. And it's like, hang on, lads. You know, this kid's just made a run. He's beaten two players. He's put a lovely ball to the back post. Okay. Who's on the back post and, you know, who's then in the middle for them? And again, these are fundamental things in football. You know, these are things that have to change. These are things that our players aren't dumb. 
But again, you know, you shoot yourself in the foot. Look, it's what it is. And our, our, our job's made harder now because we had a big home game against Reading on Boxing Day. Mm-hmm. We're very good at home. You know, you fancy us on Boxing Day. Good crowd. Everyone's families, including mine, who haven't been to a posh game for two years. We're all going. And fucking Reading have called the game off. So that's a massive frustration from a financial point of view, from a playing point of view. Um, I'm not digging Reading out. Look, we had COVID called off last year, but... You know, this was before vaccinations when we had it called off where things where a lot more people weren't vaccinated. Now you've got a lot of football teams have got, you know, our team is 80 plus percent vaccination rate. And, you, you, you know, so and, and their families are all vaccinated. So it wouldn't be as much as a threat as, say, last Christmas. So, you know, my thing there is the football league came out, I think, a week ago and told us it was 14 fit players. Mm-hmm. Yep. You know, past COVID test, you have to play. So basically, I just put a tweet up there between our under 23s and our, our first team, we have 40 players. So it would need... 25 plus COVID positive tests for a game to be called off. So they must have a lot of COVID tests, uh, positive tests, you know, um, for the game to be called off. I guess that's the only way of, of, of saying it. And I would imagine Bradford must have 20 plus COVID positive tests as well. Because let me tell you, if a lot of these clubs don't have those kind of numbers, I would imagine there'd be more than a fine coming, you know, and that's not me trying to be controversial. Um, you, you know, I'm, I'm sure the EFL mean business, you know, that when they brought out the rule, they had the 14, you know, Liverpool played Pot- Tottenham the other day, missing the best centre-back in the world and a whole midfield three. There's a COVID and COVID symptoms, no midfield. Do you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, uh, uh, rules are rules. So maybe the EFL needed to be clearer with their punishment at the bottom of those rules and put out there that if you if you don't show the, the reports and you don't fall in line, the, the fixture's forfeited. Who knows? You know how, because yeah, we've had two called off now. Um, you know, and we were talking about the hit for calling off on Saturday is a hundred grand because mm. you know it's a derby game. Uh, the, a lot of promotion had gone into selling tickets and yeah, everything that comes with it. Like, what's the? Is there a process of demonstrating the proof to say that you can't fulfill the fixture, or is it kind of a gentleman's agreement? Uh, well, well, no, I no, I think you have to report it and show all the tests, and it has to be like a proper analysis done by the you know given to the EFL. Um, so I, I, I would imagine, I would imagine the EFL have to see. You first of all, they have to ascertain your squad. They have to ascertain your under twenty threes, and they have to go, okay, you got thirty five players, so we need to see twenty COVID positive tests. You know, or, or you got 40 players, we need to see 25 because that's the rule. So I presume if a club fails to show that amount of positive COVID tests, that means they're, they're going to end up getting the fixture forfeited, I would presume. So I, I other, otherwise, you know, if it's just a fine all the time now that we live in a world where it's mass vaccinations everywhere, if it's just a fine, people will have games called off all the time. Yeah. And I'm not saying, by the way, who were playing have done that no, or whatever else. So There's an incentive so, uh, if you have injuries or if you have... That, that, you know, that's what I mean. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, it's the financial side of it. It's the it's the emotional side. It's Boxing Day and families are going. And then it's obviously a, a crunch cr- uh, clash that we beat them, we go above them. Yeah. So there are all those things to take into effect. And, and, and I guess as well, a lot of teams will want to see not just COVID reports, they want to see injury reports, you know, um, as well. How many teams maybe at this time of the year are carrying injuries to key right. players, don't want games on. So. Yeah. Yeah, um, the EFL need to stand up and, and, and really delve into this and get it sorted out. So, yeah, really, really fucking frustrating. But this is England. This is COVID hysteria. This is what happens. You know, is it is this now a, a hornet's nest, right? So we've gone through uh, talking about a circuit breaker, which, you know, has been rejected. Um, Good. And so now it's we're just going to have fixtures caught off left, right and centre. It's not, the- not if the authorities come out and say, "Look, it's not fine. You're going to forfeit a game." If you, if you, you know, they have to be really clear. We have your squad numbers. We have your under twenty threes. This is the number. If you can show us this amount of positive tests, uh, whatever else, the game's off. If you can't, you're going to forfeit the game. So I think if they're really clear and right down the line, you'll see a lot of games back on. <laughs> yeah. So, so, but I'm I'm not sure they'd be brave. I mean, I you know I know we're going to try and get Ryan on the show. I'd love to ask Ryan is, have they got have they got 15 COVID. I'm not I'm not accusing Bradford of anything, but again, that's a club involved in this like us. Uh, you know, I'd answer the question if someone asked how many COVID positive cases do you have. We have at the moment, I think four. So you know, by tomorrow that could be six. But we'll be very, in fairness to my manager, because you know he takes COVID. He, you know, he'll be back in the mask at the moment. He's at his booster, so he'll probably be in the stands watching games again. Um, he he will be very transparent about who has COVID and who doesn't. So 
um, yeah, I just think it needs to be, again, transparent. So, but look, it, it, I've said this before. I think eventually what's going to happen, they're doing it in the NFL now. You're going to see sports uh, played with people with COVID on the pitch. It's going to happen next year, you know, because it's going to be like the flu, you know, by the time every variant gets to the end and it becomes a lot more diluted. I don't think COVID is ever going to stop people playing sports in a year's time. Um, because otherwise it's just going to be for every new variant that's even more contagious. You just, you're never going to be able to put people at work. You're never going to be able to put people on the pitch, you know, on a, on a, on a football field, a basketball court. So yeah, I, I think in time it's got to change to be, I mean, when do we stop our players playing with flu? Right. You know, it's, that's the fact it's becoming endemic and correct. Um, and so as much as the media it, doesn't want it to become endemic, it is becoming endemic. Yeah. So yeah, you know, they, you know, they love it over here. I mean, I just don't get it here. I don't get it. I don't get, I'll never understand these people. You know, I, I've had people calling me out about Florida today and I'm just, I don't, I don't get why you're so upset about an area of the world whose leaders have allowed the population to make decisions for themselves. I don't get when people are so against freedom, you know, or don't, aren't we live in a democratic society where, you know, we don't live in a communist society. We don't live in a society where we're, you know, like China or anywhere else we're told what to do. We live in a society where you vote people in power and they empower then freedom to you to make choices for you within the realms of the law. And, you, you, you know, I don't get why so many people are upset that we in Florida for 20 months have lived normal life and, and, and made decisions for ourselves based on COVID. You know, get vaccinated, don't get vaccinated, you know, stay in if you, if you have COVID, you know, do all the right things. I mean, I, I don't get why people get so upset about Florida. Um, whilst pushing for more lockdowns in the UK. <laughs> I yeah, don't get yeah. it. It's, uh, you know, and everyone knows like where we are on the political spectrum, but here sure. in Florida, like we, like you say, you make your own choice and that's what we yeah. do. And, you know, our yeah. own choice is that we go out and we be careful when we do so. And if there's places where we feel uncomfortable, sure, cool. you know, we think sure, maybe, cool. maybe I'll take a step back or maybe I'll take some extra precautions. But That's up to you. Exactly. Yeah, that, that, like that, that's up to you. Um, no, like locking, that's up to you. The lock and key at home. No, and if you want to send your kids to school, you can send them to school. If you want to keep them at home, look, I, I know people in Florida who who've kept their kids home for eighteen months. That's their choice. I don't agree with their choice. I think that's horrific. I think you know that's cruel. But but that's the beauty of living in Florida. They can make that call for themselves. I know people who have absolutely stayed indoors. But people in Ireland and England just seem to a lot of them love the drama of a lockdown. They just beg for restraint. I know where the media do it. We get what they do. There's a financial incentive for them to do it. Do you know what I mean? And, and a lot of them have become very popular during COVID. I get all of that. But I don't get why normal people, unless these people never, ever left their homes in the first place. But it's just, you know, we're on a hamster wheel. And it's the, the same thing, you know. I, I, I had a little note here from this time last year, my wife's birthday. And Boris Johnson, I think, the day after tomorrow, came out and killed everyone's Christmas. And after everyone had, like, quarantined and tested and got ready to visit families. And it was, and it was again, it was the, the media buildup of pressure. Yeah, and restaurants, time. shopping. And, and it was the media buildup of pressure on Boris Johnson that got him to do it yet. And now, again, you see it building and building and building. And they're desperate for him to bring restraint. And you can see him. He wants to hang on, but he always falls. He always falls like a cheap suit, whether that's his missus or whoever else, like, pushes him. He falls. And right now, you've got less hospitalizations than last week in England. You've got 13,000 people less in hospital than this time last year. So it's fucking bizarre. So many people like Wales now have just taken fans out of stadiums. But we know that fucking moron who runs Wales, you know, and also that little idiot in Scotland. You know, they love a lockdown. You know, it was to be begging Boris Johnson for more funding, you know what I mean, During, you know, for killing their economies. Um, they just love a restriction and love a lockdown. So... I guess until these people get voted out and thrown out, who knows? I mean, England, I, I, I don't get you. Labour, Conservative, Labour's worse. Maybe the Tories need to get rid of this buff, buff, uh, uh, idiot, I don't know what I'm trying to say, idiot in charge and put someone else in there for a while. Who knows? You know, but it's it's just, it's the same. So do you have plans uh, posh for if we go to no fans again? Oh, God, no. Uh, I just, uh, I don't know, Phil, um, um, I feel like I've got a kidney stone just thinking about it. Um, well, uh, January is cancelled for sure, transfer-wise. <laughs> Which is, you, you know, and I'm having a recruitment meeting tomorrow and part of the conversation is going to be, look, you know, if that's on the horizon, forget it, you know, forget it. And I'm sure lots of clubs are going to be the same. And um, if they do this to us again, I think we as an EFL have to sue the government for funding. If they do it, because we let them off last time because the Prem gave us a little amount you know, threw us all a million to get us through like the 15 months that we fucking lost millions in. 
Um, I think we all have to come together and go, no, we need, we need to get like a proper law firm collectively and go after the government, you know, but on the basis that they set a precedent with funding other industries, you know, whether it be rugby, whether it be the arts, whether it be whatever, you know, the little furlough thing they threw at us didn't help. You know, the, the, the PAYE not having to pay it for three months didn't help. Um, none of that was actual help. So if they're now going to shut our businesses down again, um, we have to stand up to it this time. We have to be like, no, 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 no. We get it in the pandemic at the start. There's no vaccines and everyone doesn't know enough about it to do it now. Um, you know, I, I would hate to be in hospitality. And I guess I am in hospitality because we've just lost probably about 80 grand on Boxing Day. And, you, you know, and whatever else we lose in January. So no, enough. I think we all as now as 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 owners and whatever else have to go no enough enough's enough so you, you you're not locking us out from having our fans so talking about the transfer window um and and the first questions are kind of connected with the situation with covid i read an article suggesting that teams are going to be a lot less likely to loan players out because they want to keep their numbers up um one million percent are you seeing one million percent that? yes one million percent we had, we had players we were looking at bringing in on loan even yesterday, I took the kids to see Spider-Man. You've got to go see it. It's fantastic. And um, uh, as I was in the car, the kids were waiting for me like by the door with Natalie. And I was on the car on the phone to an agent. And it was a player that we were close to bringing in, who the club is now on the fence about sending out mm-hmm. for cover because of COVID. Right. And in the event that if there's any kind of no fans things, they won't maybe go and get their own new player. They'll just keep what they've got. Yes, there will be a lot of that. It's going to change a lot of plans, I would imagine, for a lot of clubs. Yep, absolutely. And so... is. So is that going to lead to a slow start in the window, not much action in the window? Like, is everyone just kind of waiting and putting plans on hold now to see how the next couple of weeks transpire? Yeah, bar, bar a few loans at the start, I would imagine there'd be no big sales, there'd be no big buys, there'd be a lot of people playing the waiting game to see what all, you know, BJ himself does at number 10. Mm-hmm. And, then um, yeah, you know, because if he, he could at any time in January just shut everything up. Some are saying the 27, 28, some are saying the yeah. second, they're using circuit breaker, they're talking about, this rule, that rule, it's also fucking confusing over here. Um, you turn on a morning show, and my, my wife always has, like, good morning, Britain, or whatever, I'm going to come downstairs in the morning, and it's just constant, this doctor from Sage, and that doctor from here, and, you know, more restrictions are needed. I mean, they just fucking love it, these people. Burn it. Fucking hell, all of you. You know, they're just, like, desperate for it to happen. And, you know, who knows? And 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 we're going to talk about vaccinations amongst players in a minute, because, again, I want to call out, like, some of the pundits who are, like, having a dig at the players. And that just It just winds me up, Phil, yeah. you know. Well, I just want to touch on transfer window for you specifically. You know, you talked about mm. um, your result and that some of the, um, you know, we've talked before about if this set of players can't do the job, then you unfortunately need to find some that can. Um, you know, here we are, what, 10 days before the start of mm. the window as we're recording, maybe uh, 11 days. You know, are, are you good to go? Have you, you kind of ready to execute on a plan? right now or mm. is it yeah we we w- w- it, it's influx it's kind of up and down you know we know we know where we need to strengthen we know we need you know i don't think it's uh you know and how can i put this i think everyone knows we're looking probably you know for possibly fullbacks and wingbacks do you know what i mean to strengthen in that area you know what i mean it's it's been an area that people will say well yeah you have no clean but it's not about clean sheets it's about the other side of the pitch as well it's a big part of the way we wanted to play this season do you know what i mean so of course, we're looking for competition in those areas. You know, we're looking for something a bit further up the field. Um, there's a lot of things. I, I can't say it's going to happen the first day of January mm-hmm. because, again, a couple of things are changing as we talk. And and that could be budget. That could be clubs not wanting those players to come out, the availability. Um, uh, have we got enough in the building to stay in this league? Yes, is my answer. Do I want to give them a hand? Yes, is also my answer. Um, we've got some very good, look, we've got some really, really talented players. They're playing way below their levels. Even the current ones who aren't endearing themselves to posh fans, maybe even to the manager, they're way below, they've fallen below their own standards, particularly away from home. And if they change the home form by 25, 30%, not home form, the away form and improve our home form by 10%, we're going to have a really good second half of the season. So it's not Mount Everest here that we have to climb. It's the fine margins, right? Um, It's the fine margins we have to get right. Uh, I'm still very, very confident we can do that. I know a lot of people disagree with me, and there's a lot of people happy when we don't do well. But, um, you you know, I still have a lot of belief in the majority of the players we have. But, of course, there's going to be four or five leaving, and there's going to be three or four coming in. That's always been the plan. Regardless where we were in the league, that was always going to be the plan. Right. 
Um, and so you did reference there about um, players and vaccine statuses um, and that being brought, you know, I guess the press are having a bit of a field day with that and you oh, can't move God. now for, well, some clubs say, well, we're 100% vaccinated, you know, as a badge of oh, honor and just arguing backwards and forwards. I mean, how is that, <laughs> Look, how is that going down <laughs> inside of football? Yeah, I mean, I, I, of course I wanted my players to be vaccinated, you know. More importantly, I wanted their older family members vaccinated. But my real reason for the players to be vaccinated was because they didn't have to then isolate for 10 days if they were caught within a COVID blow-up. It wasn't always about, you know, I, I know the statistics and I knew that even with a vaccine, you could still potentially pass COVID on. But the idea being is, you know, particularly the older generation, if they got it, it would be a lot less severe. And um, that's the beauty about the vaccine. And, and I've always, you know, said, look, you got to go do for yourself. But if you're older, you should definitely go get vaccinated. And it kills me to see, I was just some people I'm friends with even, and I'm nearly, you know, falling out with these people and nearly called a couple out. You know, one of them the other day, one of the networks he he he, he does the punditry for, mm -hmm. and he's like retweeting articles about, you know, people are out protesting vax mandates and he's digging them out. And then he's retweeting an article about the lack of vaccinations in England compared to France and Italy amongst players. And I felt like going, these players kept you in your cushy, well-paid fucking job during lockdowns. Like when lockdown started, you were still getting paid your seven figure fucking salary because these players went out and played when there was no vaccines. Mm -hmm. You were all right, you know, using these players to help fucking feather your own nest. You know, it didn't affect your income streams because these players, and now you want to dig these same players out. And I hope these players read this, remember this, and give you a fucking blank. Mm -hmm. I hope like players who are like getting hammered for not leading by example and not copying France and Germany. I mean, let me ask you France and Germany, are all, they're all in full lockdown, aren't they? So right. you got all these full vaccinated players in vaccinated communities. Ireland, I think, at a 98% vaccination rate. Well, they've killed their hospitality industry. They're in lockdown. So for all these people who were sold on the idea of get your population fully vaccinated and you'll have all your freedoms back, how do they feel now? Whilst we start getting ready for next year's boost about the booster plus shot. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I'm not having a dig at vaccines because they work. But what I am saying is, you, you know, you can't keep telling people, Go and do this, and then you'll have everything back, and then changing the script. It doesn't work like that in the real world. And I don't see why footballers have to be held accountable for vaccination rates. I mean, they have, I think it's nearly 80%. I mean, that's a pretty high vaccination rate amongst a young population who've got pretty much zero fucking chance, as you know, statistically, of dying from COVID. Mm -hmm. And don't tell me it's about them giving it to someone else, because most of the older people around them, I would imagine, are vaccinated. So again, why are we always holding footballers to a different standard. Why are we making an example out of them? Haven't they done enough during the pandemic? Didn't they keep us entertained mm -hmm. in empty stadiums? Didn't we use them as guinea pigs, yeah. you know, to go out there from the start? Uh, didn't people who work within the industry still get paid because those players went back out and played? Leave them the fuck alone. Yeah. And they, like you say, they're, the percentage rates are higher than the general population for that age range. Correct. Correct. Well, let's uh, let's move on to other interesting events that happened on, uh, I guess, on my side of the footballing table <laughs> this weekend. Hang on, hang on, Phil. I need I need to sell some Bitcoin here before you start. On that. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, what are you <laughs> yeah he's, he, we're going to uh, sell sell an NFT <laughs> of, uh, yeah. of Johnson Clark Harris's yeah. last minute penalty I, I, last year. I, I asked my son the other day, "What was an NFT?" Because I still can't quite understand what an NFT is. And he said, it's a fucking JPEG that people are fucking defrauding selling for millions and fucking mm -hmm. hundreds of thousands of pounds. And it's basically a glorified JPEG. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I've done a lot of reading on NFTs as well in the mm. past few days. Um, yeah. you know, I think that it, it, it comes with additional benefits um, sure. of, you know, being in a community of people who own those and there's things that happen from a community perspective, right. you know, close shots, right. blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But it's... Just but you get nothing. You get nothing. You you, you get it's nothing digital. tangible, right? No, it's, it's, it's a digital JPEG. Yeah. So like they're buying these <laughs> pictures of you know of monkeys, of digital monkeys to put on their profile that are going for three hundred thousand so, dollars pop. That went for twenty so I could, uh, a year ago. So I, I could digitally take a picture of my Johnson, <laughs> and I could go and sell that, sell that to the hundreds of ex girlfriends I had in my teenage years, right? To the highest bidder. Is that what they're saying? Basically, it's like only one person can buy that picture. Is that yeah. right? To the if, it, if it fits in the screen. Sorry, so, ladies, for those listening. <laughs> so, so to, to the largest bidder. So, so that, that's what an NFT is. Okay, great. So it's it's the new the new con job in the digital world. I get it. <laughs> and a lot of people making a lot of money this year over it. Of course, um, of course they are. 
So yeah, we um, there's a an article goes out in the Washington Post last Thursday yeah. about yeah. this group who have come together of um, you know really sophisticated marketing folks of influencers mm-hmm. from all these platforms um, talking about the fact that they're on this mission to use um, you know cryptocurrency to fund a purchase and then these NFTs to fund the ongoing operations of a football club in League One or League Two of the EFL to basically, you know, walk them to the Premier League because of all these untold riches. Um, And this profile of these two chaps who are heading this up in the Washington Post, and it came out, you know, pretty closely thereafter that, um, that I think it was the New York Times reporter said, you know, the club in question is Bradford City. Um, Wow. These chaps then go on a Twitter space, which is something that that was a first time experience for me is dialing into one of these things. Uh, where they spent half an hour talking about what their plans were for this unknown football club that they said they had confidentiality agreements in place with so they couldn't name. But, you know, it it was pretty well alluded to the fact that they were talking about us with all these fanciful plans, the fact that the EFL was all bought in and was really uh, supportive of them. And, you know, they're going to come and... um, invest all this money in January. Like we got four weeks till the transfer window. So, sorry, four weeks, we, the transfer window is next month. So in the four weeks, you know, we'll be in there, we'll be spending money in the transfer window to get promoted this year. Uh, you know, making it out that it was a done deal, essentially. So let me ask you a simple question. Did anybody from Bradford sign an NDA with these guys? To the best of my knowledge, no. Okay. So, okay. Um, because, it didn't, it never got that far, you know? So, right. so, so since then there's been a lot of, um, uh, you know, statements that have gone backwards and forwards. Um, right. we had, um, so, you know, this, this Twitter spaces and everything blew everything up for the football club. So then you have, uh, the chairman of city making a statement saying an email offer was received, um, you know, and kind of suggesting that we're a long, long way from anything more than that. Um, and then on Saturday, so then, you know, there was kind of this, a lot of backwards and forwards, the local journalist, Simon Parker in the TNA wrote a piece about why we should stay uh, a long way away from this. Um, I did a piece on Radio Leeds as well about it. Yeah. Very good. Very Um, good. I listened to it. It was excellent. Uh, I had to try and uh, figure out everything about an NFT in in 10 minutes before I jumped into that one. Um, so, you know, there was, uh, a lot of chatter about what this was. And Saturday, uh, Stefan Rupp, the chairman, came out and rejected it. Um, and pretty much rejected it out of hand. Um, yeah, peer and- pressure. Obviously, he, he, he got hit, obviously, by, you know, the people like yourself who wouldn't want this happening at their football club. And and I would imagine a lot of people in the industry are looking at there's a bit of a clown show going on. Yeah. So you don't want to be associated with a clown show unless the riches at the end of the rainbow are serious. Because then yeah. you're like, you can put up with the clown show because you've got your exit plan. Yeah. So, obviously, we've read that they offered somewhere between seven and ten million. Is that correct? Yeah, they, um, to buy it. Yeah, they offered, um, uh, you know, an amount that would have made Stefan, you know, it, it it was obviously enough that he would consider it because he came out on Friday with a statement to say, "Oh, that uh, uh, listen, I, I have no problem with Stefan. You know, he's an owner of a club. He's not exactly overly popular. He's getting hammered a lot. If somebody offered him." you know, the right amount of money, he's within his right to say yes. I mean, at the end of the day, he's under no pressure to say no to anybody. He gets, it's like everything else when you have something to sell. If someone offers you the right money, everyone's got a price. I've always said that. Um, questions I'd like to ask if we do get Ryan back on the show, and this might frighten him from coming back on the show, is, you know, did these people attend a match in a in a, in a executive way? Um, did anyone inside the Bradford boardroom know they were coming? Um, have they had verbal conversations, not just emails going backwards and forwards with anyone from Bradford? Um, was there at any stage the people are working at Bradford itself, not not the owner, you know, worried that this was happening? You know, did the owner see proof of funds? You know, was there a lawyer that, that represented these buyers talking with the owner? You know, and they're the questions, I guess, Bradford fans. But then again, the owner doesn't need to answer those questions. It's a private company. He, he's not beholden to anybody, even though, you know, your fans are, your, your, you know, pretty much your owners and your fan base, but he doesn't need to answer any of that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I feel about a lot of these shit shows that go on and, and try, you know, if I had somebody coming in and acting like that and then blowing it all up publicly and whatever, I'd fucking, you know what I'd be like, I'd walk. 
you know, and 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 I double my price. Yeah. You know, just to, you know, I a few years ago I got approached by um a, a, a what is it called um cryptocurrency firm just before I sold my half my stake to my current partners. A crypto firm had come in, offered me incredible money for the club, um, offered me X amount more to stay on to run the club, mm -hmm. X amount more to do amazing. I mean, it was just too good to be true. Yeah. It was all in writing. It came from the lawyers. It was, it was, it was, it was incredible. And I just smelled bullshit from the start. You know, I just like, you know, this is, this is crazy. And, and, you know, the guy came to see me because when someone makes you that kind of an offer, you're always going to sit down with somebody mm -hmm. and, you know, and then it was about, you know, proof of funds, proof of funds, proof of funds. And it was just bullshit all the time. And, you know, then wanted to hire me as a consultant for what they wanted to do. And again, I was like, no, I don't want anything to do with this. And, you know, and I still have all the emails and all the info, you know, in my Dropbox from, from that moment. So I'm always a bit suspicious. I'm not I'm nothing against the crypto world, by the way. Yeah. I've got a bit of crypto. Every, everyone who invests does. Um, and I know there's a guy who's bought Bedford Town, which is Baz's mm -hmm. club in Bedford, right. mm -hmm. um, who wants to do, you know, use his Bitcoin to to grow the club. I've no problem with that. Um, and, and he's been very transparent about his plan. And about you know merchandise and getting the club in the league. I love ambition. If, as long as you've got the money, as long as you've got the pockets, as long as you're not going to put the club in danger, as long as those fans don't lose their club because it all you know it's all pie in the sky or the, you know the shit hits the fan. I don't have an issue with something new. You can never be frightened of anything new. Any business person will tell you, you know, new and shiny shouldn't frighten you. New ideas should never frighten you. You can't be a dinosaur. So you have to think, okay, is NFT is that going to help Bradford? You know, these my concern with these people were. It didn't seem that a lot more past the initial raise of money. So they go in and buy Bradford, which is a, an institutional, an elite, you know, big club, big club. Forget about League Two. It's a big, iconic football club. And they come in and they raise another couple of million for the transfer window. And then come the summer, you know, currency blows up crypto-wise. NFTs blow up for the sham that they probably fucking are. Do you know what I mean? It loses all, its, all the allure. And suddenly they've got no doubt. And then suddenly Bradford have got a wage bill of eight million. They can't, you know, the current Bradford owner pays his bills. The current Bradford owner keeps the lights on. So say what you want about him, he, he does that. So then you 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 put this iconic club in Berry territory, and you know we've seen too many clubs like this in too much trouble. So that would be my concern. It would be interesting to hear from the EFL. I know they've said no comment because I read the Athletic article you sent me. I'm going to do a bit. I'll do some digging with my contacts at the yeah. EFL. I'll, I'll find out pretty quickly and just see like how much discussion was had with this group with the EFL. Was there proof of funds shown? Was there phone calls or is this just email willy nilly? Mm -hmm. The EFL must get a million fucking emails every day from fucking from Albania, from fucking wherever. Do you know what I mean? I imagine, you know, they, you know, pie in the sky. We're looking to buy clubs and we have money and did it. This is the way of the world. What they did with the Washington Post leaking it, I, I I don't love that. The other thing I can never understand with these these groups, they never have anybody with local expertise representing them. Right now, put me in America for a minute and with no background in football, and I'm looking to do this big thing and I want to buy an iconic club in England. I'm gonna I'm gonna seek out someone in England who knows about English football. I'm gonna seek somebody out to maybe represent me. Mm -hmm. who's going to go speak to the EFL, who's going to go speak to that club, somebody that is known domestically to fans. You know, I don't know, whatever name you want to put, you know, a, a former director of football, somebody yeah. within the industry itself. You, you're going to go after that person, you know, and you're going to try and use their experience and their contacts and their, uh, you know, I'd say their file of contacts, yeah. you know what I mean, or their digital contacts. And, yeah. and you got, what, what, what astonishes me with these Americans, a lot of these international ones, yeah, they come at it with, with, with nobody on the inside working for them and to navigate it for them. Say if they come to me and said, hey, DMAC, we want you to find us a club. We want you to get us the intro. We want you to draw up a plan. Tell us what we need to do. Year one, what are you doing? Year two, recruitment plan. Da -da 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 -da. I turn around and say, okay, guys, you're going to do this and you need my advice. You want me to work for you? No problems. You pay me a couple of million quid, I'll put it all together for you. I can do that. I can do it with my eyes shut. You want me to go and meet clubs for you? You want me to go and sit in with owners? You want me to sit with the EFL board, go through the whole process, make sure? Of course, I'm going to make sure it's kosher. They've got the funding. Not to, I'm not, but I'm not advertising myself. I'm just saying, let's, as an example, someone like me, you know, and I think then a fan of a club would say, okay, well, Darren McAntony is, is involved with this group and he's introducing her. Some fans might not like that, but they would also know that I've never harmed football. I've never 
been involved in our game for 15 years and harmed our industry. So they would know I'm coming from a, from a professional perspective and I would never want my name attached to anybody that would destroy a football club. So regardless of what kind of money they throw at me, I'd want to know they're good to go. Um, and, and it just astonishes me that they don't go through these hurdles the right way, you know? And, and, and does that, any of that make sense or am I just babbling? Yeah, no, because I mean, that's essentially from the outside, it seems that this was all pretty amateur hour. Um, mm. You know, that then re- then ended up in a battle of the statements. But, you know, they come back and, you know, try and claim that all these things that, that were being called out on uh, is not true. Um, Covering their arse. And yeah, and so today, as we record on Tuesday, Stefan put out a statement basically saying that, you know, they're, they're reserving the right to take legal action against them because of the things that they put in the statement, which, you know, I reading between the lines of that statement suggests it's more like they've called into question his, um, um, you know, the trust trustworthiness of his word and his name um, by questioning the things that he's put in the public domain in the other statements. So it's just, uh, you know, kind of. Uh, 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 yeah, it does. I mean, I've never met Stefan, um, but I wouldn't mind having him on the podcast. And, and and unlike a lot of people, I wouldn't give him a hard time because at the end of the day, like I said, you know, he's maybe got a lot of things wrong, but he's always paid his bills and he's always run the club with the best intentions of wanting to be successful. So I can't knock somebody for that as though, although he's not popular with Bradford fans and your league position is always going to de- determine that. Even some of my fans I'm not popular with at the moment, you know what I mean? So, you know, you know, because of what, what what's going on in our league position. Um, you know, and I'd give him a fair shake and just say, look, you know, tell, tell Bradford fans what you want to do here. Tell Bradford fans where your head is at. Tell Bradford fans, you know, if you're not in a position where, you know, to get a promotion might take extra funding and you don't have it at the moment, just be try- just be honest with them and say, look, I'm doing my best to keep the lights on. I'm doing my best to keep the club going. I've got good people working at the club. Um, I know I'm not, you know, popular with everyone, but I'm doing my best. And if my best isn't good enough, I'll, I'll try and sell it to the right party. So, you know, that, that, that would be great. If Ryan's listening, you should get on to Stefan and, 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 and see if he wants to come on. And, and as, as a fellow owner, I'll treat him with the respect he yeah. deserves. Well, um, yeah, we're well, uh, working on Ryan on getting on the show as well to talk in a little bit more detail on this. So uh, yeah. uh, I think when the dust has settled... Um, it's tough, tough for Ryan, you know what I mean? So he's caught in the middle of it all. Yeah, so, he's stuck between a rock and um, a place because it's not his no, of course, of course. No, 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 of course he is. And, and obviously, you know, something like this happening, I mean, you know, they're probably going to bomb him and other people out of buildings. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. the uncertainty of that over your job, that's that's not fair for people who work really hard like Ryan day to day. So, you know, that's that's tough. But yeah, look, we're, we're always happy to have Bradford people on. Yeah. Um, you, you know, and I'm sure the fan base is, is torn, you know, both ways probably on this. You know, one section, they want out. They want out from Stefan. They want a new owner. You know, the riches of Bitcoin or crypto. Yeah. You know, and, and and everything that comes with it, you get the younger fan base going, "Oh, this is so exciting," and then you get your more experienced fans being around a long time going, oh, "I don't like the smell of this." Yeah, you know, and and it's better the devil you know than the devil you don't know. So, so yeah, and that's exactly what's happened. To be honest, you know, it kind of creates that um, the a split of fans ultimately in what they want versus, and and everybody understands like we we shouldn't be where we are. And so everybody wants to do whatever we can to get out from being, you know, 14th in League Two. Um, so I certainly empathize with people who look at it and say, look, take the money because we want some money invested in the club. But, <laughs> you know, like you said, doesn't always careful, work that way. Be careful what you wish for, uh, yeah. at least on this occasion. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So let's see what else we got going on uh, this week. We have. Uh, let's go to very quickly around the leagues. And, right. Um, we uh, had the Spurs-Liverpool game, the game close to your heart. Um, <laughs> I and, watched it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Jürgen's not too happy with VAR by the sounds of it. Yeah, no, he's right. He's right. He's right. You know, at the end of it, he's got to be careful, though, because, you know, you can overstep the mark and get in trouble, but he, he, he didn't get it. Look, that was really important. Yeah, I've always said Man City are going to win the league by 10 points. And, um, you know, I saw the midfield he named, slightly perplexed how Oxlade Chamberlain didn't get in the 11. But, um, yeah, you, you, you know, and, and I have to say, I don't know if Liverpool fans agree with me, the goalie needs to be dug out. He's made too, the last 20 months, he's made too many high profile errors for me, even though everyone says he's world class. The Man City goalie is miles better than him from a consistency point of view. Um, Harry Kane's got to go. 
Robertson's tackle, yeah, he kicked the guy. Was it a sending off in today's day and age? Yeah, now it is, unfortunately. Penalties, VAR got it wrong. But that's the referee and the guy in charge of VAR. To not go over and look at Kane's tackle, but to go over and look at Robertson's one. Well, which is the worst? Who's going to get injured from both of those? The guy Robertson kicked, he ain't going to get injured. You know, he's pretty much kicked him up in the air, but half missed him in any key areas. The one on Robertson, if Robertson's foot's in the ground, he snaps his leg in half. Um, he's the England captain. He's not getting sent off. Um, you know, it was a bullshit decision. So that's the inconsistency with VAR and the, and the referee. Um, but that ref does does have an issue with Liverpool. That Robertson sending off, um, when I saw that, you know, my instant reaction was, for better or worse, this happens every week in League Two. Up and down the country. Yeah. Let me tell you, if you... Like, if you man going if through you, halfway if you, line, he hey, just gets taken out. Dan Butler's out for months because he's got a hole in his leg and his ligaments. If you saw the tackle from the player we played, it was Millwall or whatever else, you know, it's a red card in 99% of games. If you see some of the stuff going on against Dembele in games, you know, again, you know, I watched the game the other day with a player who was elbowed in the face. Do you know what I mean? And, and yeah, it goes up and, up and down the country consistently both ways. It's happening. So you let it go. So I don't get, you know, you don't send Kane off. You send him off. It, it's a, the referee's got to know it's a bullshit decision. And the guy in charge of the ref should sit him out um, for a game or two. You know, or he should be sent elsewhere. Usually he'd end up in our league. He'd probably have our next fucking match. But, you know, the, 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 the point is, it's like it was poor. Man City, as usual, Newcastle, demolished them. Um, nobody's going to stop Man City. Man City are just going to absolutely batter and pulverize teams. Liverpool, um, they were although they they went up in that game, Spurs had the better chances. Conte is getting a tune out of them. They're going to be dangerous. He's just such an elite manager. Um, they're going to be dangerous. So, and fair play to Arsenal. I love Arsenal's thing. I like the young and hungry. You know, I do. As posh fans will know, I love that. I love the bravery. I like the fact he's bombing out now. Your older players, your Aubameyangs for the shite and missing things and discipline. Uh, he's gone with young and hungry. The average age of their scorers, their assist makers, they've all come from the youth team. They bought some of the best young talent with Ramsdale and Ben White coming this summer and the boy from Real Madrid. Um, if Arsenal keep that team together, they could be very dangerous in two years' time because a lot of how they play is what Guardiola did at Man City because obviously Arteta was his number two. And if you watch the way they play some of their football, they can't beat the big teams at the moment. They play Liverpool, they get battered. They play in Man City, they get battered. But they're good enough to be top four that's a step. And then next year, when those young players are a year older, then they can start chipping away at the big teams, the the, the three teams in front of them. So, um, yeah. And then obviously, Tuchel, I read an article, he was under pressure the other day, which is astonishing. You know, I think they've had a few draws. They haven't had a good run. I think he, they're, they're, what are they, five points behind Man City, you know, yeah, like Champions 20, League winners this year. Um, yeah, yes. yeah. 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 I, I, I mean, where it hasn't gone right for them is the fact that they got Warner and Lukaku who can't score goals, which is astonishing, 100 million pound striker, and their defenders are their leading goal scorers. But if that goes and clicks in the second half of the mm -hmm. season, Liverpool could have a real issue for second place. Yeah, and just on Arsenal, credit to them, they're fourth in the league now. You know, we talked about... Told you. You know, looking, Told you. We're looking up earlier in the season and while other folks have, have faltered, they're kind of, they're just going yeah, out yeah. quietly and no. find themselves in fourth place. I like it. I, I, I like what they're doing. They they have a they have some real real talent in that team and young talent and more and more teams are going to go this way. I mean, I keep going on about how excited I'm about better under twenty threes and our yeah. you know our youth. I mean, we you know at some stage you have to break the kids out in full and give them a run and let them grow and learn. And then there might be some short term pain, but you're going to have a lot of long term gain, and a lot of clubs are going to go that route. Um, and going into the championship, I don't know if you saw the Sheffield United game yesterday. Um, yeah, great goal to win it. Yeah, very early goal. Well, it was a great goal, and I'm really surprised that they they hung on for the rest of the game. Yeah, resilient, but we know they're a quality squad. Yeah. I mean, I looked at the table today. They, they could go on a run. Them and Middlesbrough are, are poised if they do some business in Jan. I actually don't think Sheffield United didn't need to do too much business, but I move out maybe some players in a very bloated squad because they've got quality throughout the squad. Fulham and Bournemouth need to buy players. They need, I reckon they need additions. If anyone in a, you know needs to have a final push January, it will be them a couple of clubs um, because they have lost a little bit of momentum and there's too many clubs behind them. And if I was sitting in first and second with 300 million quid or 250 million quid on the yeah. line, and I have to, I have to find your club that size, you have to find 10, 12 million on a, on a player or two, I'd be doing it. Why do you think the wheels have fallen off somewhat? Because you look at both of them, neither of them have won in the last five games. You know, very competitive league, um, very much of a muchness in the top seven, eight. 
Bournemouth obviously had about injuries, younger players. Mm-hmm. They were always going to tailor out. That, that start they had wasn't going to stay going. Fulham, you always worried if Mitrovic doesn't score. Um, you know, and a couple of other players they have up there. It, you know, what do they have in reserve? Um, so, yeah, it's fascinating, really. It really is. Because you always thought, well, Fulham and Bournemouth are going up. Who's going to be the third? Yeah. So now they've, they've brought everyone in. And like I said, my little dark horse there, Blackburn, are absolutely fucked. They're trouncing uh-huh. everybody. Thanks. You know, so so it's, it's going to be, as much as it'll be block, box office entertainment in the bottom 10, it's definitely going to be the same in the top half. And we just talked about Sheffield United. Now they're only three points off the playoffs. Correct. Far too good to be like struggling really as long as they have. haven't started yet. <laughs> Correct. And their strikers haven't even started firing yet. Yeah. I mean, they've got some of the best strikers in the league. If they if they find a way to get going and flow, fuck me, like they they could go on a run. You could see them winning ten or twelve games in a row, uh, you know. And if if they catch fire, look out. So uh, yeah, it's going to be really really interesting. And then in League One, um, not a lot of games going on, but Ipswich and Sunderland um, drew one all. It was interesting to see James Norwood on the score sheet after uh, you know rumours that he was on his way earlier in the season. Yep, yep, and uh, obviously they've got a U- United under twenty three coach. Yeah, so that that'll be that'll be interesting at Ipswich. What, um, r- sorry, carry on. No, I was, what do you make of that? Because you know we talked about what a great job Ipswich would be, um, and I'm not sure if we had and and you know shame on me, I forget the chap's name, um, but I don't think we had a manager like that on our radar. I think I think they've gone down the Blackpool route, mm-hmm. and Blackpool have done very well from it. Um, he was a Liverpool um, under-23 coach and obviously coach with England. So, you, you know, look, Ashton's a pretty prudent guy, the CEO. It's his show to run. He feels maybe a young manager um, will work well, will work, gets recruited into the club. They have a good squad. It'd be a brave man to pick two clubs that are going up with Rotherham. Rotherham are going up. We all know that. You know, fair play to them. They're going to win the league, deservedly so. Fair play to Tony. Um, you know, stuck with his manager. Kept a lot of his players. Um, you know, and they're just so powerful at that level. You know what I mean? They really are. And what are they, 20 odd unbeaten? Well, I have to say, Wickham or Wickham, I mean, I was I was messaging with their owner the other day, to be fair play to him, Rob. He was messaging me about, you know, hopefully you guys can start digging out wins. And I just said, geez, you fuckers never know when you're beaten. If I see another 96 minute equalizer or a yeah, winner, you know, the, the, the spirit they have at Wickham is just incredible. So if, if they continue, you wouldn't discount them in the last, you know, if, if you're looking for the last, I always say the last 10, 12 games really separates the men from the boys. Wickham have that, I don't know what you call it, bollocks, that if they're there with 10, 12 games to go, you beat. would not, yeah, you would not bet against them, you know, yeah. when it's, when the going gets tough, do you know what I mean? So, and then obviously behind that, you've got your mighty Sunderlands, you've got your, you know, big clubs in that league. It's just, wow, what a league. You know, if you're rather a, yeah. And let's just play it forward and assume, like you said, that they're on this march and that they're certainly favourites right now and they're top of the table. You know, how, and, and I'm sure there isn't an, an easy answer to this, but can they can they break free from being that yo-yo club between, you know, League One and the Championship? Of course they can. Absolutely. Um, you know, they, they can get a run in the champ, you know, and, and, and eventually it will happen if you keep doing it, if you keep trying. If you keep doing it, if you keep, you know, knocking on the door, um, you know, it will break through and happen. And who knows? You know, they've got a really good owner. Look, no Rotherham fan can complain about them mm-hmm. going up, going down, you know, vice versa with a Peterborough fan. You know, at the end of the day, you're punching above your weight. Um, you know, so, you know, that if you looked at Rotherham last year, the only reason they went down is they had a lot of COVID fixtures they had to fulfill late in the season. Yeah. And they were playing, I think, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. And that was very, that was tough on them. You know, when you when you're not you haven't got a multi million pound squad like the big clubs and the champ, and you suddenly have to be naming your same 11, 14 players. You know, they would have stayed in that league, in my opinion. So, um, yeah, no fair play to them. And then in League Two, not a lot of action because of all the the games postponed for COVID. Uh, but there was a couple of things I wanted to to pull out. One is Sutton United now third in the table. Um, wow. which is what a great job that they're doing this year. That's incredible! Incredible. I mean, again, we spoke about this. League Two is just the, it's it's the amount of non-league clubs that have gone in and settled in really well. And you know, you go back in history from Burton to Yeovil to clubs like that who've gone flying up the leagues, you know, from non-league. And Sutton again are showing, and you love to see stories like that. I, you know, I, I like to, I root for the Forest Greens, the Suttons, you know, the, you know, clubs like Exeter. I always root for it because they have so many homegrown players they play. So I always want to see them do really well. Um, and then you you got other clubs in that league who 
have got big budgets and pay big wages and they can't match, you know, and I've always said this, sometimes it just comes down to better management, better managers, better managers. That's just the bottom line sometimes. Um, and also credit to Mansfield, you know, if Mansfield were down there bottom two for a long time. Yep. And, you yep. know, I think they had a lot of injury problems. Um, and now they stuck with us. Yeah, got on a run and they're 11th. Uh, four points yep. the playoffs and it doesn't seem like two minutes since they yeah the look jo- john and if anyone deserves a promotion john and caroline do probably you know they they, they put their, their sweat their bollocks into it they put millions into it um you know graft at it and um, they got obviously david sharp of palamine in there running things he's you know young guy they got nigel cloth they're stuck with um if they continue that it's almost like a bolton of last year bolton were like 17th last year and then went on a run and and the run didn't stop so if Mansfield continue that, it's always the, it's always the thing when you're on a great run and you get to January. Do you stick? Do you shift? Do you you know? Do you, do you upset the apple cart? Do you, do you? Well, I want an extra three bits of quality, and then you got more personalities in the dressing room, and you're thinking, "Fuck it." And I always used to, I think we got in our own way sometimes doing that. You know what I mean? It was kind of like shit. Now you're like, and the you know last year I don't think we did a lot in January, and I think it served us really well. There was no player we brought in. I want to say in January that made any difference to us getting promoted. I think we, 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 we stuck with what we had, um, you know, whereas the January before that, we brought in four key pieces that later on we signed permanently then the following summer. So it's always one of them. You've got to be really careful. You know, I've been around in January where we brought seven, eight in and it's just, it was just bedlam and it just, it doesn't work. So yeah, January is going to be fascinating for some teams to see what happens. Yeah. And the, the quality is so, oh, well, I won't say it's poor quality. It's very level. It's a level playing field in league two. So it doesn't yes. take much to go on a run. Um, and no, that's, you, that's you, what you, we're behind, uh, frankly. Yeah, you string five, six wins together, which is a manager of the month uh, award, yeah. and suddenly you can go from, I don't know, 15th to 10th, and, and, and then look upwards and plan upwards. So um, much of a muchness league too. Yeah. You know, really, you know, bar, bar your bottom four or five clubs, you know, the rest of it's all pretty even, I reckon. Yeah, and I want to just focus, have the last word in league two on one of those bottom clubs, which is Oldham. Um, and mm. I'm not sure if you've seen... Um, yesterday I saw that they're now sending letters out, giving banning orders to fans who are critical of them on social media. Mm. So sending out three-year banning orders to fans because they don't get behind the team and the project. I'm not a fan of the fucking guy who owns that. You know, I've had history with him. Um, You know, good luck to the fans and good luck to them. I mean, you know, you start going down that route. I mean, Christ, if I had to start issuing banning orders for the, you know, D Mac out crowd on, on fucking Twitter, you know, half of the kindergartens in Peterborough would be empty. It'd be just, you know what I mean? I mean <laughs> say, you know, the youngsters. And, uh, yeah. I, I, I mean, it is what it is. Look, people, I, it's funny. One of, one of my fans messaged me on Facebook this morning, uh, Jean, you know, she always messages us and she gets so upset every time we lose, you know, she, she sees the social media crowd come for me. She was sending me pictures of comments made. And it was, I said, you got to stop letting it bother you you got to stop. You know, it's not good for your health. You know, no matter what, there's always going to be a select few who don't like me. And that's okay. That's life. That's fine. I keep telling my kids the same. You're not going to, if you're super popular, you're usually super poor. Um, you know, and if that's what you want out of life, great. But I, I didn't enter life's race to be popular. Um, you know, I'm all right being popular in my own four walls or in front of a mirror. I'm all right being popular. Um, and people are just not going to like you. That's just life, uh, you know, and, and you can block them. You can block them. You can mute them. You can do whatever. Sending out banning orders. Uh, yeah, where are we going with that? Yeah. It's, I mean, they're just, they're holding on for change of ownership. I think it's clear, uh, much like yeah. that. And so how long that will take and what state they're going to leave the club in by the time that that happens, uh, who knows? Yeah. Um, we got a couple of questions that I want sure. to uh, that I ask to you. The first one is someone uh, I think who's got a bone to pick with you, who's a Celtic okay. fan. Um, okay. He says, I wonder if it's Stephen on email wrote, I wonder if DMAC now wishes to take back his previous damning verdict on, um, and I'm going to butcher the pronunciation of the Celtic manager, um, Ange uh, Post- Postikoglu. So I should know that, but that's my attempt. Yeah, uh, to take a he club, won the league cup. Yeah, to take a club totally disconnected from fans to board to players, and in six months turn that around. He's already won as many trophies as uh, Stevie G did in three and a half years. Um, factor in quality signings such as Jota and Kyogo, and show you accept that you got it wrong in August. Yep, absolutely. So you know, delighted to see it. Want them to win the league this year. 
Um, fair play. What do I know? So it just goes to show you where, you know, we, we give our, our opinion mm-hmm. and you don't always have to agree with it. And, and I like the fact that it was a polite email. You could have gone, DMAC, you're a fucking asshole. Um, you know, uh, and just done a great, listen, fair play. I saw the highlights of the League Cup win. Yeah. And, um, you know, he's definitely got them all together. And um, again, good management. It just shows you. And you're 100% right. We don't always get it right when we have a perception of what a manager's like mm-hmm. and what's going on and, you know, whatever else. So let's hope Celtic do the job this year and get the title back. Um, because that's what we, as Celtic fans, we all want that. Yeah. You know, I did take a look at the table and there's still a bit of a gap there. So uh, I think still work to be done. Yeah, it can be done, though. So, yeah. you, 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 you know, it's, it's, it's got more interesting up there now that you've got both Celtic and Rangers managers are new. And uh, yeah, I mean, look, if not this season, Ange has obviously got that he's getting a tune out of them. Mm-hmm. So long may I continue. And then we have a question from Richard on email. Richard uh, said that he's a huge portion of Miami Dolphins fan. Um, looking okay. forward to uh, giving Dara's Pats a good pasting at the end of the season. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he says that, uh, you know, we've often talked about the MLS and how it should be a lot less like the NFL in, you know, have a pyramid system. Richard's question yep. is, like, are there any things that English football could adopt from the NFL or from American sport just that you see great, in, great in question. Uh, and Fair play to the Dolphins. I think they've won seven in a row or six in a row, so they're, they're back in business. Um, yes, there are things. I like the salary cap. I like the fact that there's a designated, I think it's $208 million they can all spend next year. I like the fact they pool a lot of the money. So you've got your, your small clubs, your big clubs, all get the same kind of money. There's a lot of money pooled. I like the fact that they have a stadium fund for when teams. I've always said these are the things we need. That they've relocated, they've 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 built stadiums, they've they've modernized everything about the NFL. There's very few teams with old stadiums. Do you know what I mean? So what they've done is they've brought themselves into the 21st century. Bigger TV deals, more ratings. You know their international play. Everything about how it's run. The commissioner. You know, there's a lot of things I like. There is and. Doing a pyramid in the NFL would be very, very difficult. Do you know what I mean? The way it's the way it's set out and whatever else. And then you Super Bowl as your ultimate like entertainment factor. So I get why they do it. I just don't think it works in, in, in soccer. Call it soccer because American football soccer. So um, you know, there's so many good things they do. I like the injury reports they put out as well. You know, they have to put out on Tuesday there's designated injury reports. I like a lot, you know, there's a lot of stuff I like about the NFL. And, uh, you know, I think we could learn. And I've always said that. So great question. Yeah, there's a lot of transparency in American sport. You know, you there is there is contract details. There's nothing hidden. Everything. In terms of Everything. Anybody's on. or I, I, I like the fact that you can trade a player and the player can't fucking say, well, I'm not going or my agent doesn't want me to go. You know, you get players who walk in and get told you've been traded to Jacksonville. They have to pack their fucking locker up and go. They don't get a choice. I like that. You know, because, you, you know, you got players on contracts so you want to get out and play and, and whatever, and they've they got to go. Whereas here, players are like, no, I'll just sit here and get me money for the next three years. Well, hang on, we've got your money off someone else. Well, I don't want to move. Well, no, I, I, I like that within the industry that you've got things like that you can do. So, yeah, there is. The transparency, like you said, is magnificent in, in NFL, and, and it could be a lot better in our industry. What do you make of kind of packaging – because they make these games a destination that's more than just about the yeah. game. Um, you know, with all yeah. the entertainment and things like that that goes on within a stadium. You know, and you see football clubs sometimes have tried that and it feels a little bit out of place when you're doing it on a, you know, wet Tuesday night in Bradford versus, um, you know, in a huge yeah. stadium in yeah. Miami. Um, I like the tailgating. I like, I, I like the tailgating. You know, a friend of mine is a massive college football fan and he wants me to go to an Ohio State game, 106,000 people. And a big thing for him is he goes there at seven in the morning, he parks in the spot get a tailgate for a few hours before the game at one o'clock or whatever else. And it, it, it's not just 90 minutes or two hours or three hours in like an NFL game or a football game. It's a day. It, it's, it's you know, you, you've got singers, you've got fucking bands outside. We have a fan zone at our place before COVID we did. And it's exciting. You know, you can get the youngsters, the families involved. Anything that can get your fans more involved, spending more money, enjoying themselves, you know, I'm all for you know, if, if I could have Shake and Stevens come out at half time and sing Merry Christmas, that'd be <laughs> fucking great. You know, it brings more punters in, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, the fireworks show afterwards. Uh, or yeah, laser, listen. You know, lasers in the floodlights, you know. Uh, <laughs> hey, I, 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 I do. There's loads of what I love. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm not against music for goals. I'm not against music for before games and whatever else. So, you know, anything that can add a little bit more razzle dazzle, you know what I mean, is always yeah. good for me. 
All right. Well, let's call that quits then for this week. Um, Brilliant. Who knows how Good much episode. we're going to have uh, between now and next week. So I think we'll uh, uh, you know, keep our eyes on that. But if all goes well, we'll do this again. Same place and same time next week. If, if not, we'll yeah. keep you all posted on social. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. So thanks for listening, everyone. And Merry Christmas to everyone yeah. that's listening out there. You know, happy, you know, health, wealth, success, happiness to everyone out there and stay healthy. And, uh, you know, again, we're not here to push, you know, vaccines on people or to fear them about COVID. We just give you our opinions. Yeah. We want you all to do what's right for you and look after yourselves and your family. And hopefully Phil's parents are enjoying freedom out in Florida. Yeah. You know, they're, probably, you know. they're here now wondering <laughs> if they'll even be allowed to get let back into England when it's time to fly hey. home again. <laughs> Hey, who? Why would they want to go back? Know, right? you know, they, got, they got they got freedom, freedom with you, mate. So they don't need said, to go back. Know, stick here for the month. You know, play out the month next exactly. month here rather than go home. Exactly. You know what I mean? Free babysitters on hand, so it's like handy shandy. You know. So anyway, guys, thank you again for your support and uh, all the best. Take care. Love to you all. All right. Take care, everyone. Thank you very much.